It's late on a weekend night in Jeddah. There are no cinemas or bars and mingling with girls is strictly forbidden. So in an act of defiance, young men come to this car park and listen to Western dance music. We in Saudi Arabia tried our best, I'm talking about the religious point of view, we try our best to convince people that this is not taking you anywhere, on the contrary, it's taking you to hell. Saudi youth, like the rest of the country, are torn between fundamentalist Islam and the pleasures of the West. They are uh, in the midst of uh, what I would call a clash of cultures. And this is very difficult to deal with. Uh, so they need some kind of uh, uh, orientation or re reorientation, re-socialization, but this is not uh, easy to do. The Saudis are a tribal once nomadic people who have become one of the wealthiest and most developed societies on earth. They've maintained their strict Islamic traditions but they've also embraced consumerism with a passion. All this has happened in just one generation. 30 years ago, the capital Riyadh was a small desert town. But there is a crisis in this kingdom. The oil wealth is drying up. Unemployment once unheard of is on the rise. And even worse, poverty can be seen on the streets. These pressures have created a need for reform. But it was the kingdom's role in the September 11th terrorist attacks that has forced the country's royal rulers to question the society they had built. I mean, sometimes, you know, <laughs> shocks, no matter how awful uh, the, their background could be, are so good. You know, sometimes you're shocked into thinking about things, into introspection, into questioning things, into paying attention to things. At last there is movement. In the past year, the royal family has finally allowed its subjects a degree of freedom. Voices for reform, like those of Mohammed Mohaisen, are being heard for the first time. Uh, نحن في الألفية الثالثة وأن يكون الملك هو كل شيء هو الملك هو رئيس الوزراء هو الوزير هو القاضي لا بد أن يكون في فصل لا بد أن يشعر كل مواطن أن هناك قانون أن هناك نظام الجميع يخضع له before, this statement could have led to a death sentence. Now concerned Saudis are coming together in informal gatherings like this. Pretty unremarkable by Western standards, but in Saudi Arabia, where political gatherings are banned, it's revolutionary. <laughs> هي الشيء المهم اليوم لأننا أولا أغرقنا في التنسك حتى تركنا التمدن. Some of these individuals have tried reform in the past but have paid the price. Dr. Abdullah Hamid has been jailed four times once for trying to establish a human rights commission. Mohammed Mahaisen was exiled to Africa for four years for speaking against the regime. أن الإصلاح جاي تيار قوي 
من دفع لن يستطيع أحد أن يوقف عملية هذا الإصلاح لذلك نحن نتمنى أن يكون إصلاحا سلميا الخوف الخوف أو الحذر They're speaking the unspeakable Everyone in this room wants the royal family to loosen its absolute grip on power and for the religious establishment to change its fundamentalist ways. وفي تصوري أن لديها عجزا فكريا يحتاج إلى ابتكار خطاب حداثة سياسية Islamia. To reform the religious establishment won't be an easy task. In Saudi Arabia, the Quran is the constitution. Religion dominates all aspects of daily life. Men and women are segregated even at fast food outlets. Religious police make sure everybody attends daily prayers and remains properly dressed. Saudis follow a strict interpretation of Islam known as Wahhabism. Clerics, like Sheikh Hakim, believe Muslims have deviated from God's plan and must return to the ways of the Prophet Muhammad, who lived 14 centuries ago. In essence, what we believe in is the Quran. And the Quran is the same book with the same letters since 14 centuries ago. It's the same thing, it has not changed, not even one single letter. And this is the power of our book. No one can come and say, listen, this is primitive. This is 1400 years old. How can you live in a changing world? We say this is something divine. The problem for the reformers is that the Wahhabis are a fundamental part of the regime. 250 years ago, the royal family, the House of Al Saud, forged an alliance with the Wahhabis here at Daraya. They set out from this mud palace and conquered what was to become the modern day Saudi Arabia. And a deal was struck that stands to this day. The royal family would control all political and economic affairs, while the Wahhabis would dictate personal morality and social affairs. وتحققت بها نقلة المجتمع من مجتمع بدوي صحراوي إلى إقامة السلطة سلطة الدولة. The most obvious effect of Wahhabism today is on women's freedom. They're forbidden from driving and banned from most types of work and study. They also need permission from a male relative to travel. I was told I could not film women at close range or talk with them. But the Ministry of Information did let me meet Salwa Al-Haza, the first woman in the kingdom to head a department in a top hospital. She comes from Qasim, one of the most conservative parts of Saudi Arabia. When the late King Faisal tried to open the schools for females, and this was back, what, 35, 40 years ago, there was resistance. People were opposed to that. He was actually fought. My own maternal uncles were the people that stood against the late King Faisal. Girls had to be taken out by army trucks from the Qasim area to go to school. MashaAllah. Sawa believes women have come a long way in a short time. My mother, who's 14 years older than me, did not go to school. Can you imagine? There's only 14 years difference. Now for me as her daughter, and all were actually five sisters, all of my sisters now are either PhDs or master's degree holding leading positions in the society. So if you tell me what is the next step for the females, it has to happen gradually, okay? Um, when someone says, why aren't you, and I didn't want to really bring this up, why aren't you behind a steering wheel? I don't want to be behind a steering wheel at this moment. There are other important key issues that I want to tackle. Illiteracy, uh, positions for females, okay? Getting females 
educated, which most of them are at the moment. But Salwa is a part of a small elite of Western educated women. At present, women only make up 4% of the workforce. Wahhabi as clerics will resist calls for more women to enter the workplace. They think this would lead to a moral breakdown in Saudi society. What is the rate of rape in the West? Some say, like every in the States, every 10 seconds a, a, a woman is raped. What, what, what makes, well, they have everything. They don't have any segregations, do they? They have discotheques, bars, uh, strip bars. Uh, they have uh, work, they're working in the same uh, offices. They have secretaries, they have colleagues, they have mixed uh, uh, schools and, and universities, yet they still have rapes. So even if you think of it in, in, in a logical way, don't think of it in terms of religion. If a place where mixing is available, you have rapes. The royal family realises that it will have to rein in the power of the Wahhabist clerics if it wants to modernise Saudi Arabia. The first reform target is the education system. During my trip, the government only showed me the biggest and the best. This is the prestigious King Saud University. Education has been in the spotlight ever since it was discovered that 15 of the 19 September 11th hijackers were from the kingdom. America accuses Saudi Arabia of fostering terrorism and says the education system, with its heavy emphasis on Islamic teaching, is largely to blame. Academics here agree that the narrow Wahhabist worldview is not healthy. It does not encourage accepting diversity. It does not encourage uh, and accepting the other. And what I mean by the other is a non-Muslim. It does not encourage that. Yes, that's true. And that needs to be changed. Do you think it will be? I think it will be. I think it will be because now everybody, except the red establishment, but I guess talking to government officials, they do recognize the problem and they want to solve it. How dare such a person come and say that Islam in Saudi Arabia is narrow-minded? I don't think this is applicable. I could reverse it to him by telling by saying that those who say that Islam is narrow-minded or it's, it's uh, translated or, or used practice in a narrow uh, vision uh, uh, are themselves westernized. They are not practicing Muslims. Academics say they are reducing the Islamic content of the curriculum, not because of American pressure, but for a much more practical reason. This year, nearly half a million Saudis will pour onto the job market, and it's estimated that only two out of three will find work. Islamic theology is not applicable to a modern-day economy. This question of changing the curriculum here, you may not believe it, but so many people, and I'm one of them, we have been calling for changing this curriculum for a long time ago, long before September 11th. Yes, it makes it worse now that it looks as if we are uh, I mean, uh, responding to American pressure. That's not true. That's not the case. Why is that answer wrong? But the clerics are fighting back. Last year, the Ministry of Education tried to introduce English studies in the fourth grade. When it asks you, they hired hundreds of teachers, but the religious establishment protested so ferociously that the project was put on hold. The clerics say that learning English at an early age would corrupt young Saudis. It makes the proud Arab people looking upwards to the English-speaking people. So by introducing it in, in, the, in the fourth grade, 
kids would tend to go to McDonald's because it is part of their culture now. They study English, their parents are encouraging them to study English. So they think that English is the source of modernization and development. And they watch the, the movies, they listen to the songs, and they become completely westernized. Sami Angawi, an expert in Islamic heritage and thought, says that for far too long, the Wahhabis have got it wrong. And even if we take the time of the Prophet himself, he did not tell us, and I think intentionally, to follow one of his companions or ten of his companions. He didn't state who is the, the ones who are ready to follow. He said, follow my companions, you will be, you'll be in the right guidance. And it says, uh, uh, if you have a question, uh, ask them and then use your heart. He didn't say, ask one person. He said, ask uh, many questions and then you'll follow what heart, your heart tells you. So the diversity, the idea of interaction, the idea of dialogue is built in Islam. This is a picture of the house of the birthplace of the Prophet is here with the dome and the minaret. And, and Gawi himself has been a victim of Wahhabi intolerance. In the early 1990s, he was in charge of the heritage aspects of the redevelopment of Mecca, the most holy place in all of Islam. He says the Wahhabis deliberately destroyed historical sites relating to the Prophet's life, fearing pilgrims would glorify such sites instead of worshipping God. This is the whole house here. But when they made a decision to destroy the actual house the Prophet lived in, Ngawi says he had to act. Well, I mean, uh, the bulldozers were there, and I said, if you, uh, the bulldozer move in the site, I would, if, if you stop me, I'll throw my children under it. But the bulldozers did go to the site eventually. Well, eventually, but I wanted to document. I, most important to me, I said, I want to document. Uh, my responsibility as a, a man of knowledge and a seeker of knowledge is to keep this knowledge as much as I can, and my limit was to, to, to document it. The clerics gave Sami Angawi a week to document the house. These pictures are now the only physical evidence that the Prophet Muhammad's house ever existed. Soon after they were taken, the house was bulldozed and cemented over. Every time I look at the picture, I feel sad that it could have been preserved. Sami Angawi says Wahhabism is not what Islam is about. He wants its monopoly on the interpretation of Islam to end. We have problems within ourselves. We are out of balance, in a way, uh, because we are not allowing uh, the, the different school of thoughts and the different uh, dialogues in all the levels, and we really need that back. The problem is that the people have never known any democratic structures. Their lives revolve around the family and the mosque, which the Wahhabi clerics control very tightly. There is no room for other ideas to grow. When I tried to film at this mosque in Riyadh, I was quickly stopped by the police who work closely with the religious police. Non-Muslims are barred from any mosque in Saudi Arabia. But the local press is becoming an avenue for open debate. Although it's still censored, since September 11, they've been given the space to discuss the idea of reform. About Iraq, we, feel we are against the war in Iraq. We, we, we want peace. Khaled al maina is an editor at a Saudi publishing house that produces 17 magazines and newspapers. Well, I really think that we should be very careful and accurate. We are advocates of change. Uh, our newspaper, both the English and the Arabic, uh, talk about issues that were not uh, talked about before or discussed. We discuss 
mismanagement, we discussed sloth laziness, we discussed the need for change, we discussed certain uh, issues in society, we, we want change uh, in, uh, at all levels. The ruling family has used the media as a weapon in its tussle with the religious establishment. Last year, a fire broke out at a girls' school in Mecca. The religious police prevented the girls from escaping the burning building because they were not wearing veils. As a result, 15 girls were burnt to death. The press covered the incident extensively and it provoked such a public outrage that Saudi Arabia's ruler, Crown Prince Abdullah, was compelled to act. He took the responsibility of the girls' education away from the clerics and handed it to the Ministry of Education. The moving or the transfer from the girls' education to the Ministry of Education was welcomed by all. There were major headlines and I think that was uh, the finest hour. Uh, it is poor area. It may be a small win for the reformers in the battle with the religious establishment, but just as important is the challenge to reform the economy. This is from Saudi has just recently admitted the existence of poverty, but it's still deeply embarrassing for them. Here my minder from the Ministry of Information is showing off a woman scavenging in a bin. With one of the highest birth rates in the world, unemployment here is an incredible 27%, and per capita incomes have plummeted to a third of their value in 20 years. You know, unemployment is conducive to radicalism. I mean, it's easy to, uh, to uh, mobilize, you know, uh, people without, uh, jobless people, than, you know, someone who have a job and who is certain about his future. Prince Abdullah bin Faisal bin Turkic is one of the 5,000 princes who make up the ruling family. He believes the only way to solve Saudi's economic ills is to open up and modernise Saudi's economy. As head of the General Investment Authority, he's pursuing that aggressively, and that's put him on a collision course with the religious establishment. On economic policy, for example, I am seen as an, a big extremist. Uh, on, on total open and whatever, I'm seeing, you know, they think I'm a heretic on socio-economic, economic and on social things. But politically I might be conservative. Many reformers fear that some in the royal family are reluctant to acknowledge the country's deep political problems because it threatens their own privileged positions. وأما من داخل الحكومة نعم هناك مراكز قوة داخل الحكومة يهمها مصالحها لأنه الفساد منتشر أشكل من انتشار السرطان الفساد المالي لكن أيضا عندنا داخل الحكومة خاصة الأمير عبد الله but the prince certainly doesn't think his family's absolute power is part of the problem. The, the political system was not installed by the uh, KGB or by the oil companies or banana companies or Americans. or uh, It was evolved from within. And I generally, but again, you know, it's for you to, to judge, I believe that we don't have a, you know, a deep political problem. What we question always is the management of things and the things you know, that affect the dignity of the daily life. If the regime doesn't let Saudis participate in the political process, then extremism and opposition to its rule will grow. Seventy percent of Saudis are under the age of 30, so they are a force to be reckoned with. Reformers are concerned that with unemployment on the rise, 
disaffected youth will turn to underground extremist groups like Al-Qaeda. Let's face it, there is a sympathy for Al-Qaeda here. It's not, it's not because people in Saudi Arabia are Saudi people like what they are doing. It's just because it's out of frustration, out of uh, sometimes ignorant, not getting the facts, and out of uh, being angry at the U.S. An American-led war in Iraq will mean more fuel for the extremist fire. Al-Qaeda is the sworn enemy of the Saudi regime, and these American troops are the main reason why. Bin Laden says the royal family has polluted the holy lands of Saudi Arabia by allowing them here since the 1991 Gulf War. The Americans have demanded that the Saudis let them use this airbase, Prince Sultan, the biggest in the region. So we have many different types of aircraft. We have some of the best aircraft in the world. We certainly have some of the best uh, trained crews in the world. So I think it's, um, you know, it's put here as a combat wing with all that capability for a reason. We do consider their presence insulting, as uh, would they if we would have like uh, Saudi troops gov uh, protecting our, our consulate or embassy in, in Washington. They would not accept them to be armed and uh, patrolling, maybe shooting any trespassers. They would not accept this because this is uh, not acceptable in any country. The royal family understands that if it openly supports the US, it will threaten its own position and create more support for Al-Qaeda. At this stage, the Saudis have not let these planes bomb Iraq. Listen is the rhythm of the universe. Listen to the universe pulsating. If the royal family is going to successfully reform its society, it will have to find the right balance between its Wahhabist colleagues, who will slow the process, and the majority. Restless youth who want results now. Reformers know it will take time. Reformers are eagerly awaiting the next step. There's talk of introducing elected officials into this consultative chamber, the Majlis Shura. If this was to happen, they could then scrutinise the role and the finances of the royal family for the first time. It's a radical suggestion, but the reformers are optimistic. They believe too much has changed for their royal rulers to revert back to their old ways. I don't think that the government now will take any of the same things. Because the government is now the one who is going to take care of it. قد تكون تتحرك بشكل من البطء والتاريخ لا يعود إلى الوراث